as the market becomes more crowded, then you need to find ways to differentiate yourself on the marketplace. Business of Architecture UK, episode six. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. And today I'm talking with Gail Renier, who is a fantastic master copywriter. And in this episode, I talk with Gail about the art of copy and how he describes it as putting words together to influence people in making a decision. Um, And we really go into looking at the art and science of writing. In this episode, you will find out what copy is and how it can help you win ideal clients. We look at the mistakes that architects typically make with their copy in their sales letters, in their emails, and on their websites. We look at the triad of businesses, which is a concept of Gales to help you grow and create powerful copy to support your company. We look at the pillars of growth. These are the kind of foundations of making and growing your business. And we look at how you can turn your copy into a valuable business asset. So there's loads of golden information in here. I hope you enjoy this episode. So welcome, Gail. Welcome, Ryan. Absolute pleasure to be speaking with you this afternoon. And to get started, I I just you know the the question I've got here is you know what is copy? Why is it so important? And you were discussing with me just now uh, a concept that you've got called the triad of businesses. So maybe we'll just jump straight in. With, with that idea to help us kind of understand and contextualize what copy is. Yes, so when you look at the trade of businesses, it's really when you look at any business, there are really three main aspects um, that any business can be looked as. So the first one is really the product and services, mm. uh, which is what every 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 businesses are offering to their, their clients. Yeah. The second part of the triad is the, um, the operation. It's how do you deliver the product and service to your client, to your audience? How would you satisfy? So you've got one is the product. One is the product, yes. The second one is the how. how. Is the how. How do you deliver it? How yep. do you give it to whoever bought it from, from you? Right. And the third aspect, which is the one that I'm looking at um, as part of my business, is the, the sales and marketing. So how do you make sure that all the, the, the product that you offer, all the, the services you give to your clients, are actually seen by the right t- target audience? So how... When you come to architecture, how does your architecting uh, services are actually being seen by your target audience? Right, how how you're getting in front of the right people. Yeah, exactly, how uh, you get in front of the right people. And then to make sure once you're in front of the right people that you're using the right language. Yeah, the right word. So that's exactly that. So the first step is how do you 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 are in front of them and when you are and when they're reading your word, when they're reading your website, mm. your ads, how do you entice them to take an action? to then go to the next level and start being tra- trusted by what you have to offer. Right. What differentiates your um, your agency from another one? Got it. How do you find the specificities in what you do more appealing to a certain mar- market rather than another one? Say if you are tar- targeting, say, uh, iron, uh, ma- the iron mar- market, yep. how do you express that through your entire marketing? Right, okay. So it kind of you kind of understand the demographic that you're speaking to and then target them that way yeah exactly so there's a couple of things to look at when you um you target and when you you do the the copy so the copy is really what my clients are going to get so and that's what they're going to to use but the real work that i put in and the real work that usually any copywriter would do is really the research that Mm. comes before it so right and what i do in copy is called direct response which is linked to well, what we understand by direct response is that everything that's re- that's eaten is is as an objective for the reader to take an action. Got it. And get them to the next stage of your sales process. Right. So it's kind of action-based language. One hundred percent. So everything has what's called a call to action or a CTA. Right. And the call to to action is there being like, um, give your email address and then we'll send you a free report, mm. or click here and then buy this specific report right here and then click here and call us so it's really oriented to drive the prospect the person who's interested in your services to become a client got it 
and to know, to nurture the relationship before they're becoming a client. Got it. And I, and I know that you work with like an array of clients in all sorts of different industries and you've, you've worked with many people in the construction industry mm -hmm. in the past. What are the sort of the mistakes that you see commonly occurring uh, that people make with their copy? Right. So when you look at copy, uh, being any kind, kind of copy, so what I'll do, I'll clarify a bit for the audience uh, what we mean by, by copy. Yeah. It's anything that has a written word. So that can be from your the Facebook ads or Google AdWords. That can be uh, a web page. That can be what's called a squeeze page. You know, when you um, offer a report or something of value mm -hmm. in exchange for the email address mm -hmm. of the person. Uh, that can be on a sales letter. That can be on an email. All of these, well, piece of copies... Um, Content usually there are three main mistakes that I'm seeing uh, every time I'm speaking with the clients. Um, the first one is um, so what's called it's the sense of how um, the letter, the copy is written, and in I'd say ninety percent of the case, yeah, it's written on what's or what I call being miscentric. Right, and what I mean by miscentric is that the 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 copy talks with the great qualities of the business, of the, the, ser the services. And yes, it's very, very important. Don't, don't get, get me wrong, that has its place in the copy. Yep. However, when the entirety of the copy is only about the business, it doesn't create the relationship that's needed yep. to really entice someone to take an action with you. Right, so people are kind of focusing on, you know, all their kind of biography, where they've studied, what their specialisms are. Exactly, the awards. Um, being saying that they are being the the best in their industry, got it. Which is interesting because everybody can say they're the best, yeah, and they can say they are the most creative and so on. However, that's not strong enough to create the differentiation between their firm and another one. Right. Okay. Whereas if say you start to specialize yourself, and that's a, a little aspect when that I do when I do my research is mm -hmm. really to to get the essence of each and every businesses. Yeah. And what's really differentiate firm A from firm B? And yeah, of course, they, they would have awards. They, they, they would be great companies. However, what, what's really interesting is, where to, is when I drill down to the details of, yes, um, we focus on, say, only the entire designs. We focus only on, say, only on buildings. We focus on HMOs. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that's really start to create more value and the value that's being perceived by the client start to raise and with the value that, that that raises then that's when you start to attract more of your ideal clients right so very much becoming kind of more specific and kind of uh, communicating yourself as being an expert that's exactly that so you communicate your, yourself as being an expert and by doing that what follows is that you start to really understand the your your clients. You start to gain a deep understanding of their their wishes or why they mm. want to work with you. And the thing that's amazing in human behavior is that you, as soon as you start to feel understood, mm -hmm. so as your clients are going to feel understood, they are going to relate more with what you do. And by relating more with what you do, then we start to to know first of all to know, like, and trust you. Yeah. And that's the three main components of any marketing is to know you, to, to like you, and to trust you. Right, okay. And by having that understanding, you're going to, to lead to that trust that you have, that, that your clients are going to have with you. And then at that moment in time, well, they're, they're, they're not cl clients yet, they're just prospect. Yeah. But then when the prospects start to trust you, then they are more likely to become your clients. Right, okay. Great, okay. And so... So the, the sort of the mistakes there then, you know, people are often too focused on what it is, you know, talking about themselves. They lack any kind of, you know, uh, call to action. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly that. So the first thing being like being, having a me-centric up in the idea is to move from, the, the solution that is to move from a, a, a me-centric to a customer-centric copy. Right. Where you speak with your 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 client and their needs, the second step is how how do you how do you end up finding out about what the customer's needs are? So the first thing that starts by defining the client. So uh, as I've said, the biggest thing and the main reason why you work with a direct response copywriter is because uh, of the amount of research that he, he does and the amount of research that I do when I work with my clients. Right and. 
the thing is that the first thing is that is really so I've got a process uh, which is called the four pillars of growth. Yeah. And the first step of it is really to understand the psychology and uh, psychography of my clients. So yep. who they are, where do they live, what do they want in life, um, what's the what define as well their uh, their personality and their identity. Mm -hmm. So really, to, and when I understand that, then it makes things easier to relate to them. So that's the first thing. The first thing is you start looking for a specific niche. Who yep. is your ideal client? What does it look like? And then based on that, you will start to gain a better understanding of what value he receives from your services. Right, okay. Because many people would have different ways of experiencing your value. They would get the same thing at the end of the day. They would have great architecture from you. However, they wouldn't use it and perceive it in the same way. So I spoke with, uh, with a friend recently who's... Uh, who is an architect and he does really high end. Yeah. And what he explained to me is that what really his client wanted at first was just to have this amazing ap apartment in central London. So yeah, that's true. However, by looking at his market, which were uh, people from the, the Middle East, mm. they were here just a couple of weeks during the year. And what they really were interested in was to have the reflection of how their ap apartment w were reflecting on themselves. Yeah. So it was to a par part of it was to how to boost their ego. Yeah. And they like saw status. Yeah, right. exactly. The the status and so on. So he adapted his uh, his marketing to relate to that. Right. Okay. And how to be more focused towards the pride of owning this amazing apartment, especially when they're designed with the way they're designing them. Yes. And that's really uh, diving that understanding. And you see, as soon as you start to focus on just one niche, you start to relate to them. You start to that's what I call um, w walking a mile in their in the shoes. How would this person feel when their flat or their apartment is designed the way they are designed as the end result? When they're reaching the end result, how do they feel? Mm. And that's really what I'm looking at when I'm working with my clients, understanding their clients. So it's really kind of tapping into the emotional drivers to understand why a client is willing to invest, you know, all this money into architectural services and really kind of lay it out very clearly the value that you're bringing into that, you know, into that emotional reason. Yeah, that's 100% that. The idea, which is actually the second step of the four pillars of growth, mm. the second step is to look at um, what's called the core desire mm -hmm. and uh, the core fear of any audience. Okay. What is the desire really, in a way, not like I want, I want money, I want a house, I want nice girls and so on. It's more about... <laughs> <laughs> pe people are like that, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about how... What are the fear and desire, desire that are not being communicated? Mm. It's having great relationship. It's like what people would get yeah. when they're saying they want these nice girls. But in re reality, it's really that connection that they don't really have right now yeah the fear of being alone the fear of not having that that bond with that person yeah um and that's something that i look at as well with any of my clients when i work that what really drives human beings mm. to make that decision what dr drive them to get to the next level in their business that's really interesting very very interesting and i know in my own sales process when I'm uh, talking with clients that often most clients will always start off by saying, I want more light and space. And with a little bit of probing and kind of getting deeper, there's always something more emotionally driving, you know, that want for light and space. It can be anything from, you know, uh, they really want to have a home with their new partner, be, you know, eradicate what their ex-wife's house used to look like, or, you know, they want to build a family or... There's there's always something very powerful underneath, which is kind of really driving, driving a project, which is more than what people will often initially say. Yeah, that's look. It's exactly that. Is to really understand the deeper why of people. The deeper why. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly that. When you start to understand that, then that's when you start to relate and make people feel understood. Excellent. One hundred percent. Cool. Okay, um, and so go going back to the, you were saying the. The biggest mistakes. Oh yes. Um, and we, you kind of said there's, there's people often don't have a call to action. Yes. They often talking in a me-centric 
yes. kind of format about yes. themselves. And what's the the final one? So I'll get that in a minute because I don't think I've covered the call to, to, to action just yet. Okay. So um, when it comes to call to action, um, the thing that I'm finding time and time, time again on the website is that they don't clearly say what the person that's on the website, the, the visitor, has to do mm. next to engage with the company. It's like, what do, 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 do you want to be called? Do you want to receive an email? Do you need to fill, fill in a form? Yeah. It's like, it's there, but there's no, it's just like, people believe that they, by just leaving a number there, people would automatically call it. Right. They believe that if there's a form, people will automatically fill it in without enticing the person to take action and call the right. number, fill in the form, or leave you their emails. Mm. And there's two ways to go about that when it comes to a call to action. Either it can be, I'd say, a passive call to action, where it's just sitting on the website, and then you say, right, call this number to speak with us, to get a quote, something along yep. the line. Um, or fill in this form for more information if you've got a question. Mm. Um, but the active one would be to have some sort of pop-up that says, Download, so it would be an exchange of value. The first exchange of value where you would give, uh, say, a report, top tips. And a monkey's fist type of approach. Yeah. yeah. And in exchange for that, um, they would give you their email address. Yeah. And this way, now, the business, so the, the practice would then have the email address of the, of the, or, of the future client. Yeah. Let's call them a future client, shall we? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of of your future client. And the idea with that email address, then you have the ability uh, to really start engaging and starting the conversation with that person. Um, because one thing that is really key in any business, the real value of any business, beside the product and so, so services they are selling, is really in the client base. That's really where the value is. So, Having an email list is absolutely vital for any business to actually start creating that value that they would then be able to engage with them and then start mm. getting new business from them. That's absolutely key. And is this something that you, you, you think that a lot of um, architectural practices kind of, they don't have, they don't have email lists, they don't have CRM systems. Yeah. And they're often, what are your kind of thoughts when you've looked at lots of architectural um, websites and kind of what's missing? On what's missing. Um, so yeah, so the first thing is really to look at, as, a, as you've just said, that's the email list. Yeah. Having a tool like something as simple as MailChimp mm -hmm. is absolutely key to start engaging with it and starting a conversation with these, yeah. with your clients. Absolutely vital. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is to, be, to give value first yeah. um, to your audience, to mm. start again giving so something that, that they see uh, is going to improve their life and that's going to help them in their project. Because mm. at the end of the day, what do e people want when they're seeking an, an architecture form? They've got a problem. And if you're seen as the person that's going to help them solve this, pro this problem, mm. then they're more uh, likely to come back to you. Yeah. And that's the first step. The second step in that when you've done the, the job with someone is that by having them on a mailing list, then you have the ability to uh, re request some referral from them. Mm. Being able to uh, request someone else from their friends and families. Well, you can request them to re re refer you to their friends and fa families to get their business. Yeah, yeah. So you're actually putting a, like a, a physical ref referral system in place. Yeah, exactly. In communication and yeah. you're just keeping a conversation going. Exactly. Brilliant. Cool. Exactly. Okay. So... And yeah, so yeah, the third biggest mistake, that's cool. So the, the first two were having a misentry copy. Yep. The, the number two uh, was to have no call to action yep. on the website. Mm -hmm. And the third one is to have no headlines on the website. Right. And either going straight um, into some project work, going straight to talk with the business, and not relating to what the client, the visitor wants to see. So for the so, sort of like for a total novice, what do you mean by a headline? All oh, right, a headline that that's exactly the same thing as what you see on newspaper. Right. So okay. it's like these couple of words that really strong, really impactful, that are going to drag the the re reader to read the next line, mm. and that's really strong and where the person has the ability to identify himself or herself in what the content of the web website is going to be about mm. and how and what's the promise of the website. 
what's the promise of the of yeah what's the the the, pro, the, uh, the promise that the per, the person was going to get after reading your content i like that yeah and that's that the biggest thing it, it's it's really fast it's really fascinating because i kind of think um you know back to architectural education and lots of websites that i that i see you know this is a conversation that's often uh had on this on this podcast about architects we tend to use a website purely to demonstrate you know all about us and for it to be another beautiful design project in and of itself and architects like minimalism we like sparse things yeah. and we like beautiful images yeah. and often you will see a kind of a website that looks stunning and you've got beautiful pictures of a of a building and then maybe just a kind of discreet little arrow where you can flick across to the next image and there may be very minimal text all together yeah. and actually we're kind of forgetting what the purpose of the website is which is to sell services yeah, exactly so i think it has its place yeah don't get me wrong i think that having the, the portfolio being able to showcase what you do as a as a business is absolutely critical mm. to the success, to the success of the business however that shouldn't we shouldn't f forget that the main point is to you can only do that mm. by having work yeah and to do the work <laughs> that you love well you need to win it yeah you need to to win the work that you love to be able to do the work that you love and that's the thing that's absolutely key so i think that's and that's what when I'm always referring about being miscentric when yeah. you talk with your project how great you are and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's idle and it's true. Mm. I have no doubt in the world that that's the case. However, from a client perspective, we need to shift that 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 view about your website to be more about how can you express what you do mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense for the person who reads. Yeah, and that's the thing that's key. How do you articulate? what you do in simple terms. Yeah. Instead of being convoluted terms that you would have learned at school and at uni. Yes. That's, that, 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 that are great, they're accurate, they, sh they, they show that you know your stuff. Yeah. Uh, however... It's not talking to the right people. That's exactly it. Yeah, you yeah. don't talk to the right person. Yeah. Now this is, and it's a total mindset shift yeah. as well, really. And you kind of got to really meet the client where they're at you see, it's very interesting what you said because I spoke this week with a with a client of mine, and mm. he told me that uh, the biggest th thing, and that that's what I call a hidden benefit of what I do, mm. is to help him. He told me that I've helped him to see his business in a new light mm. by relating more about um, his client and from his client standpoint, yeah, than from his business itself. Yes, and when you do that, he said that yeah, it's allowed me to really review and re-articulate the value that I'm delivering to my clients. Yeah. And th and those kinds of relationships with clients where you're able to talk their language and they become the most fulfilling projects, they become much more rewarding, you're able to give more value because you're talking the same the same language and it's all around a far far better it's exactly ex experience that. for both for both parties. Exactly. You transform the relationship you have with your clients. Yeah. That's exactly that, because from the client perspective, is going to be excited and absolutely love working with you. Yeah. Because you are on the same wavelength, you speak the same language, and for yourself as the the architect as well. Yeah. Imagine if you do the work and that's fully understood by your client, mm. that your clients really understand the love that that, that you're pouring into into your work, mm. and that's really what you get when you start to focus on what you give as a service. Yeah. And that's. That's something that's absolutely, uh, I think, is vital in this day and age. Mm, brilliant. So um, we we also started talking about the the four pillars of growth, which kind of leads on yep. from that about how you actually go about establishing the right type of language to use to your specific client. So you kind of you, you said that you you go into a lot of the psychographics and demographics yep. of a client, and then you'll you'll start talking really to pain points of a client, their fears and their desires, yep. and really trying to understand the emotional reasons for why it is they want to 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 create a building for example yes what are the other pillars could see of course yeah so the two more pillars the the third third one is what i call the level of awareness of the market mm. and that's some, something that i've not invented that's something that's uh that's been there for four years that's that's been in uh that has been used by advertiser for years but it's not very well and very often shared outside of the advertising realm and what it says is that um, at any point in the market you cannot speak in the same way 
mm. based on where your client or your prospect is at. So I'll give an an, an analogy again about women and <laughs> and, and girls. Well, of course, you're French. So Dating, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm French. So here we go. It's the language of love. So. The language of love. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, the thing is that yeah, it's like when you when you engage. What I'm saying, women, it's more in, uh, about relationship. Mm. That just widen the the spectrum about relationship and not women as such. Uh, by that, what I mean is that what you have is that you wouldn't speak in the, the same way with your wife of fi- 15 years mm-hmm. as you would speak with your first date. Mm. If you ask your wife of fi- 15 teen years, what's your name? Where do you live? Mm-hmm. What do you like to, to do, do in life? You might get slapped in the face. Yeah. Right? And if you s- speak with your first date and ask her, where would you like to go for our next holiday? She might just go and up and leave. Yeah. So, which is how you adapt what you're saying to your target market, based on your relationship with them. Mm. If they know you really well, you're going to communicate with them in a special in a special way. Th- think about your clients. You wouldn't speak to your clients in the same way as you speak with someone who just came for the fir- the first time yeah. on your website. Ah, okay. So there's actually like levels of you know, different languages for different relationships. Absolutely. For different stages of the relationship. That's exactly that. Based on the stage of the relationship, you need to adapt what you're going to share with um, with your public. Right. And that's something that's absolutely critical and very often, and that's a mistake I'm seeing time and time again uh, when we go beyond the three biggest mistakes that we've just shared, Yeah. is that people expect to capture the market and new market with the exact same text, with the exact same words. Right. However, the the words and the, the text that has worked to a level of awareness will not work with the next one. Mm. There's there's five in total. Uh, so if say you use a level two uh, level of awareness mm-hmm. um, to speak with a level three le- level three market, mm-hmm. it's not gonna work. They wouldn't get it. That's as simple as that. Right. So this is a kind of like a maturity of a client they kind of go through level one level two level three level four level five exactly and in that education process that maturing process they're learning you're learning a new language to speak with them or that's exactly that they're not looking for the same thing yeah again it's about what they know yeah about your products and services the more they know about it the less you need to talk again about it it's a bit like you say you need you want to choose a new car and you are debating, but say, a Mercedes and a BMW. Mm-hmm. And then when you're bound to buy it, you know that uh, that you you want either a Mercedes Class C or a BMW Series 3. Yep. And then when you just would to go and buy, the um, the salesman gets back to, to you and says, right, so did you know that our the engine in there is like 200 brekos power, which you would know because you would have done your research and you're just about to buy and about to make that de- decision. Right. And if you start engaging with your client in the same way, when they're just about to buy, and you give them the the, the, the details they're not interested in, yeah, they're gonna leave. Yeah. Or, or are you going to lose their trust because the client had the assumption that the, that you already built that level of trust and and relationship and that they're feeling understood? But then if you speak with them and say, right, go in the, and then you bring them back to square one, mm-hmm. they won't enjoy that. Yeah, they feel like, like, oh, I know all this kind of stuff already. Yeah, exactly. They're not interested. Yeah. Ah, I see, I see. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, oh, and cool. so this level, what's the fourth the, the fourth, fourth pillar? Oh, yeah, so the fourth one is the, it's what I call uh, the stage of sophistication. Right. So each and each every market, again, for any product that you can see around you, mm-hmm. so if you, have, you take the iPhone 4, mm-hmm. for example, you, use, you went through the stage of so- sophistication. The stage of so- sophistication is about... How many competitors do you have at any given moment in the marketplace? Right. So if we take the example of the iPhone, because it's an easy one to understand, is that when the first iPhone came out, it was pretty much one of the very first, if not the first, touchscreen mobile phone in the world. And having that, uh, they've been able to be in that marketplace on their own with no competition pretty much. Yeah. They were com- competing with like Blackberries and so on, but not with uh, touchscreen mobile phones. So, and then as time went on, 
more and more um, devices just like the iPhone came in the marketplace. Yeah. What do you think with the Samsung, LG, yeah. um, HTC, and so on and so forth, and yeah. Motorola, and so on and so forth. And as time w- went on, because the marketplace started to, to become more and more cr- crowded, mm-hmm. the the way the marketing and the co- the communication went about the devices had to, to change to really highlight the specificities of each and every device. So the customers were able to see the differences between an Apple and a Blackberry. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the thing. So and as the market becomes more crowded, then you need to find ways mm-hmm. to differentiate yourself on the marketplace. And that's the the simplicity if you like that you've got a couple of st- stages as well. You've got four. The first one is that you are on your own in the market. Mm-hmm. So it's like Apple, you the very, very, very first in the market. And then you've got w- one competitor. Then the uh, stage three is that you've got m- m- multiple competitors. Yep. And then stage four is the one it's a completely crowded, crowded market. Yeah. And you, at each and every stage, you've got ways to market and to advertise what it is that you do. Right. And that's the thing that's absolutely absolutely key and vital is how do you adapt what you say to make sure it resonates. So it's really interesting actually because th- what I'm what I'm really getting from this is that you know I kind of would have thought about copy as being something that you do once you kind of cut and paste you stick it all over all your you know you know your marketing materials but actually it's an it's an ongoing conversation that you have with your clients and you've got to you know when you when you work with a client how long do you typically work with them for so that depends so when it's on a project basis the project they they usually they usually between uh, 4 weeks to 6 weeks mm. however that's the thing because as you've said things evolve yeah the market pl- the marketplace ch- changes and evolves mm-hmm. the thing is that um that's something that Requ- requires to re re review the copy that, that you write wh- that we are writing. Yeah, I don't presume that I've got all the answer and that I know everything for sure. Yeah, as in with any marketing, the the goal of of marketing is to test. Yes, new ways of talking about your product and services. Right. So, which is why I usually work w- with my clients on the longer term. So I've got longer relationship with them, usually six months to a year at least. Right. Um, to make sure that's what we've done together is working and how we can make it work better. So we improve what's called the conversion, yeah. which is the number of people who took an action. Mm-hmm. And then by improving the conversion, then they usually make more sales. And that's a longer term process. So yes, copy, even though you would, as you say, you, you, you stick it everywhere, you still need to monitor it. You, st- you still need to see how it's performing. So you have the ability to improve it. And which is why... Um, when people engage with copywriter, the thing is just a once and done process. Yeah. While in reality, uh, and that's the way I work, because I see myself as a brand partner when I work with my clients. So I work with them in a way that helps them and their business mm-hmm. to really grow and move forward and to really uh, well in- improve their conversion rates. Yeah. And how, how do you test? How do you test copy? Okay, right. So that's a very good question. So the way you test copy is to do something that's called uh, A-B testing. Right. Or split testing, yeah. And the idea is that um, at any given moment, the idea is that you you test fifty uh, percent uh, of the traffic. Which by by traffic, what I mean is the number of people mm-hmm. who see your copy. Uh, so you send fifty percent on the control version, which yeah. is the default one, the one that you know is currently in place, and then uh, you split with the other fifty percent to the new the, and the improved version of the copy. Right, and then you kind of you keep on making incremental changes yeah. and refine it and refine it. That's exactly that. Right, brilliant. And I mean, it sounds like there's so much to this. There's so much kind of wealth of knowledge that you have um, in copy. How can people find out more? Or people want to work with you. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So the way um, I work with my clients, it's well, they we we usually engage on a. I've got. Web- webinars, so I've got a monthly web- webinars and I've got a monthly masterclass which is live in London. Yeah. Um, so I've got one in August, one in September, and then I would have 
uh, one more in uh, October, November, and so on. Do you, do you work both in English and French? Yes, both in English and French, yes. Amazing. And do you find that there's any kind of differences between the two languages? In this what, is, in what is, sense? Like in, in terms of your strategies or... So usually the strategies are the same. So yeah. the methodology is, is exactly the same. Mm. So I go through the same processes. The only thing that changes is how we evolved the market is in France and in England. Yeah. And that's where I need to adapt. Right. Very interesting. Great. So sorry, yeah, you were saying you have monthly webinars. Yeah, so yeah, so I've got monthly web webinars and monthly masterclass. Uh, so the web webinar, you can access it from anywhere in the world. Yeah. And the masterclass, only available in London. Right. Very good. Uh, from a date, I usually do the uh, webinars on the third th uh, Tuesday of the month and the masterclass on the fourth one. Um, and that's yeah, that's for anybody to come and join. Uh, and what they would get from there is the methodology that I use um, to write my copy, and I write copy for my clients. Um, and I've got as well, so I, I run a practice, so I do a done for you service. Yeah. So where I do the consulting with my clients, understanding their their needs for the businesses, and how um, copy can help them sell more of their services. Got it. So if people want to work with you or, or learn more about copy, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you or yeah, um, utilize well, your services? Thanks for asking. Um, the easiest way is to uh, really to drop me an email uh, at info at services42.com and say hello, Gail, uh, which is spelled G-A-E-L. And yeah, and then we'll start to have a chat and start a con conversation from there and I'll be in touch with them. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very awesome. much, Gail. Awesome. Thank you. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>